Are you there? All right, we're here. Very good. Now, are we still studying Corinthians together? <laughs> well, <coughs> I guess so. <laughs> okay, that's what we're supposed to be doing? I don't know, actually. I'm just translating here. <laughs> okay. Let's, uh, could you guys turn the lights on in there? It would help me a little bit to see you better. Ah, much better. I think we were uh, about in 1 Corinthians 7 when we stopped. Uh, have you all been studying 1 Corinthians there as well? Yes, yes. Okay. So we'll look a little bit in 1 Corinthians 7 and then we'll move on today. Uh, in the book of Corinthians, there is uh, a definite group of questions that the Corinthians had asked Paul. Uh, these can be identified with the phrase now concerning. If you look at chapter 7, verse 1, he says, Now concerning the things about which you wrote. And he seems to answer these things one at a time. Look at uh, chapter 7, verse 25. He says now concerning virgins. Then if you look at chapter 8, verse 1, he says now concerning the things offered to idols. Then if you look at chapter 12, verse 1, he says now concerning spiritual gifts. Then if you look at chapter 16, verse 1, he says now concerning the collection for the saints. And then finally in 1612, he says, now concerning Apollos the brother. So, following the pattern we see in, introduced in chapter 7, verse 1, these are the questions that he answers. Now in chapter 6, uh, starting with about verse 9 down to the end, he talks about fornication. This uh, begins a section on sexual conduct and sexual sin. Это начинает раздел о сексуальном половом поведении и о сексуальных половых грехах. It says in chapter 7, verse 1, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. И вот седьмая глава первый стих, о чем вы писали ко мне, то хорошо человеку не касаться женщин. It seems to me that the phrase, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, is probably what some of the Corinthians were saying. Some of them were reacting so far against sexual sin that they were uh, turning toward complete abstinence. Uh, что их уносило в крайность полного воздержания. 
But Paul wants to make clear that God has a plan for man's sexuality, and that is marriage. Однако Павел делает ясным, что у Господа есть определенный план относительно половой жизни людей, и этот план включает брак. This is sort of like back in 6.13 where the Corinthians were saying uh, meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but Paul said, but God shall destroy both it, it and them. Uh, это похоже на структуру 13 стиха 6 главы. Мне кажется, что Коринфе не говорили пища для чрева, чрева для пищи. Но Павел отвечает, но Бог уничтожит и то и другое. So when the Corinthians said it's good for a man not to touch a woman, Paul replies, but because of fornication, let each one have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. God's plan for mankind is not celibacy, but marriage. Now, Paul makes it clear that if celibacy is your gift, that's fine. But God's plan is for people to be married. Now, some people, because they have uh, violated God's laws of marriage, end up choosing celibacy as a way of life. Matthew 19.12, Jesus indicated that some make themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Если вы прочитаете Матфея 19.12, то там Иисус говорил, что некоторые сделали себя скопцами ради Царства Небесного. In this passage, he says to avoid fornication, we should be married. Но здесь в этом отрывке говорится, чтобы не было блуда, во избежание блуда, люди должны жениться. In verse 3, he says that the uh, woman should give herself to her husband and the husband should give himself to his wife sexually. He explains that the woman does not have authority over her own body but her husband and the husband does not have authority over his own body but the, but the wife. Он объясняет, что жена не имеет власти над своим телом. Эта власть принадлежит мужу. Равно как и муж не имеет власти над своим телом, но его жена. In verse 5, he makes it clear that, that husbands and wives were not to deny each other uh, sexual congress because Satan would tempt them if they did. И в пятом стихе uh, Павел учит, что не нужно жене и мужу воздерживаться от близких половых отношений, потому что этим может воспользоваться сатана, чтобы их искусить. So he encourages husbands and wives to nurture the sexual relationship so Satan would not tempt them for their lack of self-control. Он учит мужа и жену возрастать в своих интимных отношениях для того, чтобы оба получали удовлетворение, чтобы у сатаны не было повода искусить их в этом вопросе. This goes back to verse 2 where he says to avoid fornication. Let everybody have their own wife and let everybody have their own husband. Возвращает нас ко второму стиху, где говорилось, что именно во избежание блуда пусть у каждого будет своя жена и у каждой свой муж. Now verse 6 and 7 goes together where he says he wishes that everybody could be like he is, single and celibate, but he realizes that that's not possible for most people.
Но он понимает, что не у каждого это конкретно реальная возможность. So marriage was God's plan from the beginning. Поэтому изначально Божий план для людей состоял в браке. But God's plan is for marriage between one man and one woman for life. И у Бога план такой. Один мужчина, одна женщина. Это одна семья на всю жизнь. Now, in the verses following that, uh, Paul speaks in three distinct paragraphs. You'll notice in verse 8 he speaks to the unmarried and to the widows. Прежде всего, в восьмом стихе он обращается к безбрачным и вдовам. So underline that. Подчеркните эти два слова. And then in verse 10 he speaks to the married. Далее в десятом стихе он обращается к вступившим в брак. Подчеркните. So you should underline that. Подчеркните у себя эту фразу. And then verse 12 he speaks to the rest. И двенадцатый стих прочие. And this is a subcategory of the married. It's those people who are married to an unbeliever. So let's look at these uh, categories one at a time. Uh, the first is uh, verses 8 and 9 to the unmarried and the widows. Итак, давайте рассмотрим эти категории одну за другой. Первое, восьмой, девятый стих, это безбрачные и вдовцы. Now, I believe that this is those that have never been married and the widows. Я считаю, что под безбрачными подразумеваются те, кто никогда не был женат, и вдовы и вдовцы, это те, кто вдали. And I'll tell you why in just a moment. Я вам объясню через минуту, почему я так думаю. He tells them that it would be good if they could remain as he is. As he said in verse 6, you know, it's good if, if you can do that, but most people don't have that ability. Later on, he's going to tell them that the reason he wishes this is because there was some kind of, of trouble going on that would make marriage difficult for them. И поэтому в восьмом девятом стихе 
Хотя Павел сказал, что лучше не вступать в брак, он объясняет, что если кто-то не может воздерживаться, то пусть вступает в брак, потому что лучше вступить в брак, нежели разжигаться. Now this, this word burn at the end of verse 19, I think, does mean to burn with lust or passion, because Paul uses it this way elsewhere. If you look at Romans chapter 1, and let's go down here to verse 27. You can see that Paul uses similar terminologies describing homosexuals. Alright, so have to have somebody read verse 27. Alright, so you see they were inflamed or burning in their lust toward one another. This seems to be the same uh, terminology he uses in, in 1 Corinthians 7. Did you have a question? Somebody raised a hand up in the back. Uh, uh, yes, Stas has a question. Mm -hmm. It's also in chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians. Um, first of Alright, so 
Nine and eight and nine says that the the unmarried and the widows should marry if they don't have the self control to be celibate. Итак, восьмой девятый стих учит, что безбрачные и вдовы желательно должны оставаться такими же, если только у них нет особой нужды. И тогда они могут вступать в брак и не сохранять целиком. Now, in verse 10, he speaks to a different group, to the married. Then, uh, he uses this phrase which Stas brought up, uh, to the married I command, yet not I but the Lord. When he says the Lord, he's referring to Jesus Christ. He's referring to the things Jesus taught in the Gospels. He's saying that Jesus covered these things in the Gospel of Matthew and other places. Он говорит, что Иисус уже поднимал эти темы и объяснял, как должно быть и в Евангелии от Луки, и в других местах. In passages like Matthew 19, uh, 1 through 12, Jesus talked about how that people should not leave their mates and they should not divorce and remarry. В таких местах, как Матфея 19 глава, с 1 по 12 стихи, преподается учение именно самого Иисуса о том, как они следует разводиться и что делать в случаях с разводом. So Paul is basically repeating here what Jesus has already taught or said. Так что сейчас Павел просто повторяет то, что уже говорил Иисус, то, чему Иисус уже учил. Now what Jesus taught was that the woman should not divorce her husband, should not leave her husband. Чему же учил Иисус? Что жене не должно разводиться с мужем. Now the word for leave there is a Greek word koridzo. Слово, которое переведено как разводиться, это греческое слово koridzo. Koridzo is the same word used in Matthew 19 verse 6. Это то же самое слово koridzo, которое использовано в Матфеи 19 главе 6 стихе. That's where Jesus said, what God has joined together, let not man koridzo. So the word koridzo had reference to divorce in Matthew 19.6. And here, in this passage, Paul is talking about what Jesus taught in Matthew 19, 6. Now, in, verse, in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 11, Paul talks about what happens if the woman does koridzo, if she does divorce her husband. He says, if she does koridzo, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. Now this shows me that the unmarried in verse 8 and the unmarried in verse 11 are two different groups. Поэтому, как мне кажется, безбрачные из восьмого стиха и безбрачные из одиннадцатого стиха – это две разные группы людей. In verse 9, Paul tells the unmarried in verse 8 that they can go ahead and get married. В восьмом девятом стихе Павел говорил безбрачным, что они могут снова жениться. But he, in, in verse 11, he tells this group of unmarried to remain unmarried, to be reconciled to their mate. А в одиннадцатом стихе вот этим другим безбрачным предлагается либо оставаться таковыми, либо мириться со своим мужем. This shows me that the ones in verse 8 are those that have never been married. Поэтому я говорю, что безбрачные из восьмого стиха это те, кто никогда не были женаты. 
And the ones in verse 11 are those that have been married and divorced for some reason other than fornication. He gives this person two choices, remain unmarried or be reconciled to the husband. And he makes it clear that the same applies to the husband at the end of the verse. Now, in uh, Mark <coughs> chapter 10, verses 11 and 12, Jesus taught that the same thing that applies to the husband also applies to the wife. It didn't matter who divorced whom, the, the rules were the same. Let's have somebody read Mark 10, 11, and 12, please. Давайте кого-то попросим прочитать Марк 10, 11, 12, please. So verse 10 and 11 are what Jesus taught about married people and divorce. Now in verse 12, Paul is going to cover some things that Jesus did not cover in his earthly ministry. He's going to address an issue that Jesus did not address in his teaching. That's why he says to the rest, I say, not the Lord. He meant that Jesus didn't say anything about this particular issue. But we should not think that Paul's words have less authority. Look back at chapter 2, verse 13 about the authority of Paul's words. Посмотрите еще раз в начале послания, во второй главе 13 стихе, об авторитете слов Павла. He says which things we teach not in words taught by human wisdom, but those taught by the Holy Spirit. А здесь Павел говорит, что то, чему они учат, они получили не от человеческой мудрости изученными словами, но изученными от Духа Святого. And then if you look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37, Paul, Paul clearly says that the things that he's writing have the same authority as the things that Jesus said. Have somebody read 1437 for us. So, when Paul says, I'm addressing this thing that Jesus didn't address, we should not think that Paul's teachings are less authoritative. 
Когда Павел говорит, что я вам объясню тему, которую не преподал Иисус, это не означает, что заповеди Павла будут обладать меньшим авторитетом, чем слова самого Иисуса. The teachings of the apostles are just as authoritative as the teachings of Jesus. Учения Павла обладают таким же авторитетом, как учение Иисуса. Look at John 13, verse 20. Посмотрите на Иоанна 13, стих 20. Here Jesus was talking to his apostles at the Last Supper. Здесь Иисус разговаривает со своими апостолами во время последней вечери. And he was about to send them out to the world as apostles. Read what Jesus said about those whom he sends. Истина, истина говорю вам, принимающий того, кого я пошлю, меня принимает. А принимающий меня принимает пославшего меня. So to receive the apostles is to receive Christ, and to receive Christ is to receive God. And we cannot receive one without receiving the other, and we cannot reject one without rejecting the other. So in this in this verse, well go ahead and translate that. То есть нельзя принять одного без другого или нельзя отвергнуть одного, не отвергнуть всех остальных. So the teachings in verse 12 and following are just as authoritative. Поэтому учение Павла из 7 главы 1 Коринфянам с 12 стиха и дальше обладает таким же авторитетом. But now this is different than what he says in verses 6 and 7. Однако вы заметите, что здесь Павел говорит что-то другое, не похожее на то, что он говорил в шестом и седьмом стихе. There he says that what he's saying is not a commandment, it's just a concession. That makes you know that it's not required that you remain celibate. Там он говорит, что сказанное мною это как позволение, а не как повеление. То есть он говорил о свободе выбора в принятии решения о целебации. But he doesn't say that same thing in verse 12. In verse 12, he's simply talking about things Jesus did not cover in his teaching in the Gospels. Uh, there are other places in Paul's writings where um, he asserts the authority of his own teachings. Есть и другие места в послании от Павла, где он доказывает авторитетность своих учений. For example, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 15. Например, 2 Thessalonians 2, стих 15. Have somebody read that? И мы попросим кого-то прочитать это место. 2 Thessalonians 2, 2, 15. And then 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 14. All right, so when Paul wrote, he expected people to do what he said. All right, so let's address what Paul did say in verses 12-16. The rest, which he seems to address in verse 12 and following, are those that are married to unbelievers. This seems to come from the Old Testament teaching that Israelites were not to marry foreigners. Кажется, том, 
in, in Ezra chapter 9 and 10. When the people came back from captivity, they were told to put away the women they had married that were foreigners. This violated the teachings of the Jewish law. So the Corinthians seemed to have thought that if, if they were converted and their spouse was not, that they now were married to an unbeliever, a foreigner. And they wanted to know if they could, if they had to leave that person because that person had not become a Christian. But several times in this passage, Paul says, do not leave. I noticed at the end of verse uh, uh, verse 12, he says, let him not leave her. This is if any brother is, has an unbelieving wife and she's content to dwell with him. The same situation in reverse is addressed in verse 13. And notice at the end of verse 13, he says, let her not leave her husband. And this is in the imperative, it is a command. It is the command of an inspired apostle. It's not a, a suggestion. Um, so, in, he says, do not leave, do not leave. In verse 14, he explains to them that they are not unclean or unholy if they are married to an unbeliever. In the Old Testament law, they were considered unclean if they were married to a foreigner. But, verse 15 says, you can't help it if the unbeliever departs. Now this word departs is korizo, exactly like you have in verse 10. <coughs> Now remember what Paul said in verse 10, Jesus taught that if you corizo, you must remain unmarried or be reconciled to your spouse. Now, in this uh, next statement, he says, in such cases, the brother or sister is not bound. Now, I want to show you, if I can get my uh, picture up here, uh, this word that is translated bound. Okay, let's go in here and zoom in a little bit on the paper. 
This is the Greek word for bound. And it is pronounced dedulotai. It is from the word which means to be enslaved. Now it is in the perfect tense in Greek. That means that it is something that began to be true in the past and is still true in the present. What that means is the brother or sister was not enslaved in the past and is still not enslaved in the present. This is not the word that Paul uses to, to describe the marriage bond, the, the what ties a man and woman together. Uh, you can look up this word in if you can look up in a Greek lexicon, uh, doulos. And it means a slave. All right, so the point is that when Paul makes this statement, he's saying that the brother or sister is not now and never has been a slave of the unbeliever. We are slaves of Jesus Christ. If the unbeliever makes demands on the Christian that the Christian cannot do as a Christian, for example, if the unbeliever says, uh, we're going down to the idol's temple and you're going to go with me, and if the believer says, no, I can't do that, or if the unbeliever says, we're going to go to one of our wild uh, parties with our pagan friends, and the, and the believer says, no, I can't do that. Or if the unbeliever says, we're going to swap sexual partners with our neighbors, and the believer says, no, I can't do that. And if the if the unbeliever says, well, if you don't do these things, I'm going to leave you. Well, the believer is not a slave of that husband or wife. The believer is a slave of Christ. So the unbeliever will just have to leave. But that does not give the believer the right to remarry. Because verse 10 still says that if you corizo, you should remain unmarried or be reconciled to your mate. 
Потому что 11 стих настолько, что научил. Если вы корица, то вы должны остаться безбрачными или мириться с мужем. But Paul's emphasis is still stay with the unbeliever. Однако главная мысль у Павла такова. Если супруг неверующий, то он не против, оставайтесь вместе с ним. Because notice how he comes back to it in uh, verse 16. Потому что смотрите, как он возвращается к этой теме в 16 стихе. He says, how do you know a woman if you might save your husband? Почему ты знаешь, жена, не спасешь ли мужа? And how do you know, oh man, if you might save your wife? Или ты, муж, почему знаешь, не спасешь ли жену? So, as he said several times earlier, he, what he wants is for them not to leave their mate. И, как он уже повторил несколько раз, он не хочет, чтобы верующий оставлял своего неверующего супруга. But to stay with them and try to uh, win them to Christ. Now I want, you, I want you to look at verse 17 and I want to show you how a lot of people misuse this verse. He says, each one uh, as the Lord has apportioned him, each one as God has called him, so let him remain. In context, that means remain with your unbelieving husband or wife if you were converted and they were not. Some people want to make that read if you've been divorced or remarried unscripturally, remain with whichever one you have at the present. But that ignores the context of verses 8 through 16. Um, what he's saying is you shouldn't change your marriage state just because you became a Christian. Что Павел говорит? Не нужно менять свое супружеское положение только потому, что ты стал христианином. А в контексте понятно, что Павел говорит, что речь идет о том случае, когда ты уже стал христианином, твой супруг или супруга нет. So verse 17 really is just another way of saying do not leave your unbelieving mate. Okay, I'm sure you've got a question or two, so go ahead. Gave permission when to marry and when not to marry. 
Павел не утверждает это здесь однозначно, но видно, что в той культуре именно отец принимал окончательное решение о том, будет девушка уходить замуж или нет. In fact, in this, in this passage later on, where he's talking about, it says that the father should not forbid his daughter to marry. He does not say what happens if the daughter goes ahead and marries. She may have sinned in disobeying her father. But it says in verse 28 that they have not sinned if they marry. He goes ahead and says in the rest of that long paragraph that it's better if they didn't marry because of the present distress. Дальше тут очень большой отрывок. Он продолжает мысль, что лучше ей все же не выходить замуж, потому что приближаются какие-то гонения, проблемы и несчастья. Вернуться назад к восьмому и девятому стиху седьмой главы, где Павел непосредственно обращается к еще не вступившему в брак. And it says that it's okay for them to go ahead and get married. <laughs> Other question? Жена связана Део со своим мужем законом, 
This is not the word used in chapter 7, verse 15. It says that after the husband is dead, she is free to get married. This word is also used in Romans 7, 2 and 3. I'm talking about the word deto, which means to be tied to somebody. Let's read seven, uh, Romans 7, verses uh, 2 and 3. Well, let's actually read 1 through 3. Okay, so in verse 2, uh, the woman is bound by law to her husband as long as he lives. That's death. That is the word also used in 1 Corinthians 7.39. It is a completely different word than what is used in Romans 7.15. Or 1 Corinthians 7.15. The one in 1 Corinthians 7 means to be enslaved. It does not have reference to the marriage bond. It means that the unbeliever cannot assert his will over the believer. Because the believer is now and always has been a slave of Christ, not a slave of the unbeliever. Now, some people would say that it still implies the right of the uh, believer to remarry. But I disagree because back in verse 10 and 11, he already told us what happens if somebody corridzos. And remember the word Corizo comes from Matthew 19.6. And that is the word that occurs also in verse 10 and in verse 15. You need to study these things out for yourselves by looking up these words. And look up in a Greek grammar what is the meaning of the perfect tense in Greek. Anybody else have a question?
но потом они уверовали и крестились в Исах, в Иисуса Христа, в оставление веков, и они поженились. Они чистые или, или они блудники? If a man was, uh, had been divorced two times, and then he was converted, and a, a woman was divorced, but then she was converted, and they met each other in the church, uh, do they have the right uh, to create a holy marriage, or they are uh, considered to be unclean? Well, uh, I do not believe that whether you're a Christian or not a Christian determines whether you're married or not married. Uh, God's marriage laws apply to all people. And uh, when you become a Christian, uh, you have to repent of your sins. And if these people have been unscripturally divorced and remarried, uh, Jesus says that uh, they need to be single or be reconciled to their legitimate mate. Божьи законы о браке распространяются и на верующих, и на неверующих одинаково. И когда человек становится христианином, он крестится и омывает свои грехи, но по Божьим законам брака он должен оставаться либо безбрачным, либо мириться со своим первым законом в глазах Бога мужа. Now most, uh, many preachers teach that when you become a Christian, you just keep whatever mate you have. Большинство проповедников учат тому, что когда ты становишься христианином, ты должен а, оставаться в таком а, состоянии по отношению к супружеству, в котором ты обратился. И свои слова они основывают на вот этом отрывке в главах. And three times in that paragraph, Paul says, let everyone remain in the state in which he was called. He says it in verse 17. And he says it in verse 20. And he also says it in verse uh, 24. But if you go back to the previous paragraph, verses 12 through 16, He's talking about people who are married to unbelievers and whether they ought to leave them because they're unbelievers. Verse 10 and 11 makes it very clear that he's not talking about people that are unscripturally divorced and remarried. В 10 и 11 стихе о вступившем в брак однозначно здесь имеется в виду те вступившие в брак, которые имели законные основания вступления в брак. Они были отпустены в течение. Мне как проповеднику это очень тяжело, это очень трудно принять Because I work with people in these situations all the time. And sometimes their situation is difficult to determine. Like sometimes they're pretty sure that their spouse committed fornication, but they're not, they don't have proof, they're not positive. Например, иногда разведенный убежден в том, что его предыдущий супруг был ему неверен, совершал прелюбодеяние, но у него нет при этом никаких доказательств. И в таких случаях окончательное решение об участии этого человека нужно оставлять Господу. 
But it's our responsibility as preachers and teachers to teach them what the Bible says. Но наша ответственность как проповедников и как учителей Библии состоит в том, чтобы научить людей тому, что говорит об этом Библия. And once we've taught them exactly what the Bible says and showed them the scriptures. Если мы достигли своей цели и показали людям из Писания все, что говорит Господь по этой теме, then we have delivered our own soul and the responsibility is theirs to obey God or not. If they tell us they believe they have a scriptural right according to what we've taught them from the scripture, что у него есть библейское основание для развода и для второго брака, потому что так написано в Писании, то какое тогда у нас есть право с ними об этом спорить? Нам нужно объяснить человеку, что мы не боги, мы не Бог, и что им придется перед Богом отвечать за свои поступки и за свои решения. Но Однако, в чем нам нужно быть крайне осторожны? В том, чтобы не дать человеку в такой ситуации почувствовать, что у него все в порядке, если Библия не дает ему этой гарантии. Person, uh, Christ, если человек был алкоголиком, а затем он был крещен во Христа, от него ожидается, что он отвернется от своего пьянства, когда становится христианином. Если два гомосексуалиста прожили вместе 10 лет до того, как стали христианами, от них ожидается, что они прекратят свои отношения If something was wrong before uh, baptism, it's still wrong after baptism. If something was right before baptism, it's still right after baptism. Baptism does not change something from right to wrong, or from wrong to right.
Islam, uh, and then he becomes a Christian. What about the cases like this? Who? <laughs> <laughs> You know, that is, that is very difficult because, uh, um, you know, I have no idea what the answer to that question is. I think a person like that, are, are you talking about somebody that had a voluntary sex change or are you talking about somebody who uh, was a hermaphrodite? Yeah. 
Christians, but were they married? Они не были христианами, 
Job was an Edomite, and he wasn't even a Jew, but was he married to his wife? Marriage goes back to the covenant in the Garden of Eden and has nothing to do with being a Christian or not a Christian. This idea of being married in the church goes back to Catholicism. It's the old idea that you're not married unless a priest marries you. You can't find anything like that in the Bible. You got it. The brother up front here has a question. Christians taught about divorce and remarriage. 
Коллеги, на следующей неделе я бы хотела вам показать, чему учили первые христиане в отношении брака, развода и повторного брака. And also some things that the, uh, the Jewish rabbis taught about divorce. And we'll contrast these with some of the things that Jesus and the apostles taught. Let's, let's take a couple of minutes break and come back and we'll finish the class. Thank you. 
рассмотрит это поведение. Need to learn Russian, Oleg. 
The question that Anatolia asked before, <laughs> it is asked, asked it, um, you know, accurately. And it turns out that his question is, if a man was uh, twice divorced uh, because of adultery, and his, um, and this lady was uh, first divorced because of adultery, and then her second husband died, and she's a widow, and they were baptized, and they well, become they, a, they can get married anyway because both of them uh, have scriptural reasons for divorce. He, he, he has a question uh, about this particular <coughs> case, this particular people, because some brothers uh, tell this man that he cannot be a preacher. Though he is a preacher, they uh, they say you don't have a right to be a preacher because of all of these marriages and all of this. Uh, <laughs> no, if a man is scripturally divorced and remarried, then he is right in the sight of God and can preach anything he wants to preach. Yes, the man is not a preacher. He 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 это проблема человеческая, не больше. Что здесь? Согласно Галатам 4 глава 1.4. Как христианин, он тем более должен проповедовать. And uh, uh, he replied that, uh, that according to Galatians 4.1, uh, 1 through 4, uh, he, is not, he does not only have the right to preach, it's his obligation to preach. Yes, he, he's talking about he feels compelled to preach the gospel. Well, it's probably the wrong scripture. He doesn't remember it correctly. First Corinthians 14 is what he's after. Verse. Uh, well, one to me if I preach not the gospel. Is that what you're talking about? First Corinthians chapter nine. First Corinthians nine. First So if the preacher has followed the teachings of the scriptures, he can be an example. 
Если а, сам проповедник исполняет заповеди Писания, то тогда он и может быть образцом. As long as he is scripturally remarried. Если он действительно женат во второй раз по библейски правильно, тогда это будет правильно. Also, if a preacher was divorced unscripturally. И также, если проповедник был разведен неправильно по Писанию, не по библейски. If he remained unmarried, according to 1 Corinthians 7, verse 11. Если он остается безбрачным, как здесь сказано в первом Коринфянам семь одиннадцать, he could still preach and be consistent with the teachings of Scripture. Он по-прежнему может оставаться проповедником, потому что он поступает правильно по Писанию. But if a preacher was unscripturally divorced and remarried, однако если какой-то проповедник был разведен не по Писанию или женился во второй раз не по Писанию, he would either have to change his teaching, то ему нужно либо менять свое учение, or his life would be inconsistent with the things that he taught. Потому что сама его жизнь не соответствует тому, чему он учит. Anybody else? Смотрите, я такую как бы, цепочку нашел. Если, допустим, жена неверующая, у верующего мужа не хочет как бы оставаться с верующей. Ну, просто как бы ей не подходит жизнь христианская, там ей не нравится, что муж как бы себя так ведет. Она уходит как бы, от него и уходит замуж заново. То есть, ну, то есть она замужем и так далее. Страдушка. Бессовестный поступок, я понимаю, с ее стороны, но как бы мужчина остается страшным всю остальную жизнь. Или он должен обратно стыжить. Um, so, uh, I can't touch the two of you at once. You've got to be quiet. The wife doesn't want to stay with a Christian husband. She doesn't like his lifestyle. She doesn't approve it. And she divorces him because of his uh, uh, belief and his convictions. And even though later on she marries somebody else, The divorce was not scriptural, and he uh, has the right to remain unmarried and uh, and go back to his first wife. Or uh, if, if she is married again, then he has only one choice to remain unmarried. Is that right? Is this? Uh, That's the way I understand it. Yes. Now, I don't understand why God made all these uh, laws. And I have great sympathy with uh, the people. But, but my job is simply to teach people what God says. Uh, as a preacher, that is your job. Uh, you cannot change what the Bible says just because you want to make it easier for people. Your job as a preacher is not to make people happy, but to make God happy. Two more questions, then. Yes, first in the back. Муж верующий, жена неверующая. Жена уходит от но не прерыводействует. Муж не имеет права второй раз. Сатана действует через неверующих людей или нет? Вопрос первый. Действует. Ну, это ясно. Действует. 
В таком случае муж остается сам, сатана воздействовал через жену, и сатана имеет доступ к самому верующему. То есть верующий уже не имеет права жениться, а как же в таком случае не разжигаться? In a situation like the one that Roman asked about, uh, it, it was very cruel for my wife uh, to put uh, her husband in a situation when he has to uh, stay uh, unmarried. However, uh, it's obvious that Satan was working against this Christian and he used his wife uh, against him. And yes. now, as you see here, uh, he is still using uh, this fleshly desires to tell this man, uh, don't you think it's just way too much? And then temptations are, he just uh, ended up in a situation when the temptation is stronger than him, and, and, and this is not his fault. It's her fault, actually. Yes. Um, <clears throat> however, if you go back to Matthew 5:32, Oleg, Matthew 5.32 Read that verse for us. А я вам говорю, кто разводится с женою своей, кроме вины прелюбодеяния, тот подает ей повод прелюбодействовать, и кто женится на разведенной, тот прелюбодействует. То есть неверующая жена подает повод прелюбодействовать верующему мужу, получается. Yes, I think that's what Jesus is saying uh, in uh, Matthew 5.32 is that the man who divorces his wife without scriptural cause is making her commit adultery. Because he's almost pushing her into a situation where she'll commit adultery. Okay. And it, it does seem unfair. Uh, however, if it's a Christian spouse and his wife uh, uh, pushes him to an adultery by her conduct, uh, can't we say that Satan is responsible for this situation? Yes. Yes, Satan is responsible for the situation, all the way around. So what's the way out? Uh, Look at Matthew 19, verse 12. And we always on the verge of sin? Yes. Look at Matthew 19, verse 12. Вы слышали, что сказано древним, не прелюбодействуй. 
А я говорю вам, что всякий, кто смотрит на женщину с вожделением, уже прелюбодействовал с нею в сердце своему. Если же правый глаз вы соблазняет тебя, вырви его и брось от себя, ибо лучше для тебя, чтобы погиб один из членов твоих, а не все тело твое было вержено в гиену. То есть остается единственный выход оскопить самого себя. По воле неверующего супруга и по воле сатаны, который воздействовал через неверующую супругу. So the conclusion is my only way out would be to make myself a eunuch because of my uh, spouse's will and because of Satan's will against me. If, if there was no other way, maybe so. If there were no other ways, maybe so. Получается, сатана, воздействуя через супругу, подталкивает человека, чтобы он принял решение отскопить самого себя. So the Satan is using your spouse against you, so that you have to put you. Yes, that's exactly right. Uh, let, let me say this, Oleg, look at 1 Corinthians 7, 11 again. If you look carefully at 1 Corinthians 7, verse 11, it says you can remain unmarried. Anybody who remains unmarried is going to face the temptations that you're talking about. But he says that in this verse he clearly says that if uh, it was your initiative to divorce your spouse, then you have the right to remain unmarried or reconcile with her. However, yes. if it was your initiative, if it was her initiative and she made you divorce, yes. then uh, she, she, he says that... But in Matthew 5.32... It's the other way around as well. It says whoever divorces the woman that was put away commits, whoever marries the woman when she's put away commits adultery. I didn't write it, I'm just reporting it. <laughs> yes, sir, back there. А вот смотрите, если вот эта же ситуация и и одна половина, как бы, ну, которая была инициатор, ну, уже там замужем женился человек. То есть, ну, не христиане. А христиане, ну, как бы, ну, там уже дети, там уже как бы семья. Ну, я не знаю, ну, смешно стало человеку в моем жизни. Он хочет возобновить свою правду. То есть, ну, и в конце концов, как бы, разрушается та семья, и бывший супруг становится обратно супругом. Ну, то есть, слава пойдет, как бы, ну, от церкви не особо. Uh, what if uh, uh, this divorce took place no, and the spouse is already no, married the second time, no, uh, this non-Christian spouse, and she has children of her own in the second marriage, and then the first husband wants to reconcile with her. And she is uh, uh, the second husband, and she is uh, to accept his, uh, first, her first husband. Doesn't it make the reputation of the church Uh, not very attractive, you know. It's, uh, it seems to be such a uh, difficult situation when it looks like yes. one friend is <laughs> It's definitely something that the world would not understand. Uh, uh, here, here's what I want to point out to you guys and want you to think about it very carefully. 
Вот что сейчас я, ребята, хочу вам показать, и я хочу, чтобы вы серьезно об этом подумали. All of the arguments you've been bringing up to me are rational and emotional arguments. None of you have been trying to make scriptural arguments. The scriptures are the authority. Not our feelings or our emotions. So what you need to do is learn to question scripture by bringing up other scripture. Many people feel that baptism couldn't possibly be necessary for salvation because uh, they know good people who have called Jesus into their heart and they haven't been baptized. But that doesn't change the fact that the scripture says that baptism is necessary for salvation. Many of the people that you will hear talk about marriage and divorce will use emotional arguments but not scriptural arguments. Always ask the question, but what does the scripture say? Okay, you've got one in the back, back there. Louder. We didn't really want to argue with you. We just wanted to make sure we understand uh, the best way to uh, uh, solve No, 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 no. I'm not using the, ar the word argue to mean you're being argumentative. That's not what I mean. No, I when I say you use your arguments, I don't mean that you're arguing with me. I don't mean to imply that you're having a wrong attitude. I don't think that at all. I'm just saying that when we discuss something back and forth, let's try to bring scriptures that bear on the situation, not just feelings that bear on the situation. It's perfectly natural to have the feelings that you're having. I have sat with many people and wept and shed my own tears as I have told them what the Bible says. Я нередко сидел с конкретными людьми, обсуждал с ними тему о браке разводе и рыдал вместе с ними крупными слезами, потому что такова была их ситуация. Однако совесть моя не позволяет мне сказать человеку что-то такое, чего в Писании нет. Because Paul said we are to declare the whole council. He says we are to preach the word. We are not to preach our feelings. Especially when our feelings contradict God's word.
That is one of the things that makes being a true preacher of the gospel a lonely business. Uh, we have had people leave our congregation because they were angry at our teaching about divorce. I can remember a wealthy family whose daughter fell in love with another man. She wanted to divorce her husband and go marry this other man. She wanted to have her new wedding at the church. The elders told her that no, this was wrong and they could never support what she was doing. She left the church and her family left the church. But I respected our elders for teaching what was right. In the process, we are teaching our young people and generations of our young people to look at marriage in the right way. Потому что этим поступком мы показали своим молодым людям и своему молодому поколению, что отношение к браку и что вступление в первый брак должно происходить очень серьезно. Those that compromise these things teach their young people that marriage and divorce is no big deal. А те, кто идут на уступки в этом вопросе, учат молодежь своей церкви, что они могут, ну как бы, пробовать, экспериментировать со своей супружеской жизнью и рискуют своими душами. Now I have to go, but next week I'm going to talk to you about what the Pharisees said about divorce and remarriage. Сейчас мне нужно идти, но на следующей неделе я обещаю вам показать, что учили фарисеи и раввины в отношении брака и развода.